You can just set that down if you want. A very good morning to everyone. We're glad you could join us here today, whether you're here in the sanctuary with us or viewing live, streaming live today, or picking us up later on. We're very, very happy to have you here today. What a beautiful, glorious weekend that God has provided us with. And uh, we just want to rejoice in that. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So today we have our call to worship. And it's taken from the Psalms 126 verse 6. And this psalm is written to the Jewish pilgrims as they were ascending to Jerusalem. And they were struggling with God's will versus their own will. And... They were having a real tough time because they felt such a separation from God. Because they were following themselves instead of following God. And what God had been leading them to do and calling them to do. And in effect, they were saying to God and to each other, they were saying, Well, show me first and then I'll trust you. But see, God says, trust me first and then I will trust show you. I will reveal all these things unto you. So as it was written in the psalm, it says, those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. And in this, they were being told about trust, that if they simply trust God and in his promises, they will have it returned to them several times over. And in our lives today, we we face these same kind of struggles. But the same thing holds true for us today as it did for them back then. We need to learn to lean on God and not on our own understanding. And when God is calling us, he has something larger in store for us. And he has things that he will reveal to us as we are drawn closer to him and as we respond to the calling that he has for us in our lives. So let us go to God in prayer and thank him for this day. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to gather here together in your name, to gather freely to hear your word, to soak up your promises to rely on those promises, to guide our hearts and our minds, to guide us by the Holy Spirit, to bring us into that fullness and that realization of what you have for us, Lord, in our lives. Lord, we just ask a special blessing on Pastor Terry and the message that you've given him to share with us today. And we look forward to that message and we just ask that we would receive that message into our hearts, receive that message into our spirits, Listen to that calling that God has for us to put in our hearts today. And as we go through the week ahead, we just ask, Lord, that you would bless us with those gifts. Bless us with that calling that you have for us. Help us to respond to the calling that you put on our hearts today and every day. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. We are getting ready to start back up with our weekly Bible study starting this Wednesday night. And Mark and I were talking about it. And we were going to, we're going to do a study on the spiritual gifts. And last night Mark said, so uh, what, what are you preaching on about the spiritual gifts tomorrow? And I said, well, God and I wrestled about that. And I lost. I wanted, I really had a message that I wanted to speak to you all about the spiritual gifts. But he said, no. There's something more important that I need you to speak about today. And so here's where we're at. He said, I want you to join the harvest. And I said, all right, God, I'll join the harvest and I'll bring God's people with me. And here's the thing. I come from a farm family. And some of you out there may come from a farm family. You may know what I'm talking about. I always got out of walking beans and detasseling 
because my dad worked for a company called Hagee Manufacturing, and Hagee's makes high clearance sprayers and detasslers. And I figured it was a conflict of interest to be walking beans and detasseling. But some people think that farming, just like being a pastor, is only a part-time job. They think, oh, you're just up there. It's like pastors, you're only up there on Sundays or, or on Bible study. You're only at Bible study, and you only work about three hours a week. And, and there's, more, there's so much untruth to that. Just like farmers. Farmers, oh, they put in the crops, and they take out the crops. Well, there's so much more to it than that. They, they prepare the fields, by, and then they plant in the spring. And then at, in the fall, they harvest. But in between that time, in between that time and during the rest of the year, time is spent on upkeep of equipment. And it's spent watching the markets and selling their harvest when the price is high. I can remember sitting in my grandmother's uh, dining room and the, the markets are on. And of course, this is back, this is like a little seven inch black and white TV. And it was WHO out of, out of Des Moines and the markets were up. And I was like, okay, this is, I want my cartoons, Grandma. But it was important to them because that's how they would make money. And then they had to plan what to plant each year. Are we gonna plant corn again and again in the field? Or are we gonna alternate with soybeans? Or are we gonna give it a year of rest? And if there was livestock, there was a whole nother thing. My grandparents, they had chickens and they, at one time they had cows. By the time I was little, they had pigs. And I would always say, let's go see the peats because I couldn't say, I couldn't get the G out for pigs. But again, there's more to it. We, would, we wouldn't necessarily walk beans, but we would go out and we would pick up rock. Now that's something a machine can't do. It can turn over the dirt, but it can't pick up the rock. So there was, there's more work to it and more equipment upkeep. And then there's all the different local, state, federal, FDA regulations and, and requirements that they have to, and, so, and you almost have to be an amateur meteorologist to be a farmer, because you gotta really kinda watch the weather so you know whether you can be in the field or not, whether your tractor's gonna sink in the mud or not. Being a farmer also takes faith, because you could lose your crops. There's uncertainty. You don't know what's coming. You don't know what the weather's going to be like. But the goal of it all is to produce good crops and healthy livestock. Because the farmers feed the world. And, and I, that just resonated with me about how God, it, he wants to produce good crops. Good crops meaning you and I. And, and he wants us to be healthy. Well, most importantly, spiritually healthy, but also physically and mentally healthy. See, without farmers, we don't eat. We don't survive. So there's no pressure on them at all, right? But for us, for God, we're going to talk about a different harvest today. And if you've got your Bible or if you've got your smartphone or, or whatever, go ahead and open up with me to chapter 9 of Matthew. And we're going to start in verse 35 this morning. But over the next few verses, this is a summary. This is a summary of what Jesus was doing in his ministry at that time. And the primary three things that, that will be talked about in this first paragraph here is Jesus is teaching, Jesus is preaching, and his healing. And, and through his ministry, he taught us so many things. He taught us about life. And he taught us about finances. And he taught us about marriage. And, and he teaches us about the law. He teaches us about forgiveness. And he teaches us about salvation. This just covers a few of the things. He, he has this huge, huge list of things that he teaches us. And we really need to be in the scriptures to understand what those are. But in addition to what he's been teaching and preaching and, and the healing he's done, he's also been casting out demons. And he's also, he's calling us, he's calling us through that preaching and that teaching, he's calling us, he's calling us people to faith. 
And that's where we get to verse 35. Here, it, it, this section is called the need for workers. And so it, it reads this. Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So here we are. We had that first verse that we already talked about where he's doing the teaching and the preaching and the healing. But in the second verse, in verse 36, Jesus is recognizing the neglect of the people. He sees the crowds and he realizes that the religious leaders are neglecting them. They're not paying attention. They have more important things they need to deal with. And, and we see this every single day. You can pick up the paper, you can turn on the TV, you can listen on the radio, or you can just walk in your, in your community and you're gonna see people who are suffering. There's fear, there's anxiety, there's depression, there's poor health, there's worry. And, and the things that are causing this are, are things such as, uh, uh, you know, the, that poor health is also part of this because it causes some of the worry and the anxiety and the depression and the worry, but also money. Whether or not we have a job or not, is there a roof over our head? Do we have food on the table? You know, Pastor Mark has, has worked in the past with uh, HACAP. And, and people, they might have food, but they're deficient. They don't have enough food. They're, they're food poor. And these things cause all these things. There's also some other things that have come to light recently. And, you know, until you sit down and truly think about it, what are we doing about those things? Right now, this country is dealing not only with a disease, the COVID-19, but we're also dealing with racism. And I have no idea what my black brothers and sisters are going through. But I know some of them are worried and some of them are angry and some of them feel neglected. And I just want to listen. I want to listen like Jesus would have listened to them. I want to hear what they have to say so that I can better understand it. How can I be better? But that goes back to Jesus' teaching. He teaches us how to get away from the fear and the anxiety and the depression and the worry through those things that he was teaching us about life and marriage and those other things. And here's the thing, without those things, we become unhealthy, we become weary, we become defenseless because we don't feel like we have somebody in our corner, but we do. The problem is, is if we don't have God there, then we lose hope. And once hope is lost, all the other things just tumble right after it. And here's the thing. People are working longer. I think about when I'm going to retire, and I, I, I remember as a kid, I thought, oh, it's 60 or 62, man, retirement. All right. And now I'm thinking maybe 70, 72. And at my age, the age that I am at right now, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. I've got a few things going on with my health, and I'm, I'm really actually feeling pretty good. And I have that peace is not in my sights. But it's sad that, you know, we have to work longer and longer, especially when we're dealing with other things. But here's, the thing, here's another thing, even with all the technology that we have, we can't help with everything that people are going through. Technology can't fix everything. And we pray to God to get rid of diseases. We pray to God to, to calm things. We pray to God for all these different reasons. Sometimes his answer is yes, and sometimes it's no. And other times, it's hit the pause button and wait. And as Pastor Mark said during the call to worship this morning, we can't lean on our own understanding. We have to rely fully on God. 
So, think about what happens when somebody you know or something that uh, you see gets neglected. What happens? Well, I can remember, and I've, I've always noticed this for some reason, but when you're driving down the road and you look off to the side and you see this once beautiful home, the roof's caving in, the windows are broken, and that home might only be 30, 40, 50 years old. It's been neglected, nobody's living in it, there's no air, there's no uh, air conditioning or heat to help keep that home the way that it needs to be. But then you look and you see these other buildings that have been around for centuries because they've been taken care of. People who are neglected are the same way. Yet they don't necessarily, they fall apart, but they fall into anger and they fall into resentment and they fall into worry and all those other things that we've already talked about. And that's when we see people, they get to a certain point and then they, if they can find something to rally around, they fight back. Now I say, we need to fight back with God. We need to get God in the mix. Now, there's a, a gentleman I know, his name is Will Keeps, he's got a, a ministry in Des Moines, and he wants to educate black kids. He wants to bring them up and, and teach them. And that's how he's protesting. He's, he's, he's going to work. Others are going to the streets to raise awareness. We need to also do that with our God. We need to join that harvest because people need to be heard and they, needed to be, they need to be treated with respect. But Jesus realizes that the people out there aren't getting that. So listen to this Old Testament scripture from Ezekiel chapter 34, verse five. It says, so my sheep have been scattered without a shepherd and they are easy prey for any wild animal. Jesus recognizes this. That's why he saw that the religious leaders were ignoring the people. And for this reason, he had compassion on them. And he was not going to ignore them as they had been. This fulfills what's written in Psalm 918, where the psalmist writes, But the needy will not be ignored forever. The hopes of the poor will not always be crushed. Jesus comes to give us that hope so we aren't crushed, so that we aren't ignored, and so that we don't lose hope. He came to take care of the poor, and I would say he came to take care of the poor in spirit, the spiritually deprived, or in the people in spiritual poverty, the sinners, the marginalized, those that society and the religious leaders just basically have written off. See, homes can be repaired, but so can lives, but it takes God in our lives to repair that. We need to restore people to dignity. And when we do that, things like anger and resentment and worry and depression, those things do start to fade and people become healed. Everyone just wants to be heard. Now hear what, hear what Matthew writes about what Jesus says in verse 37. He said, he said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. In other words, Jesus is calling the disciples to pray to God for people to go out and proclaim the gospel. And, and the workers... That's the apostles. That was the disciples that were with the apostles and Jesus. And that's you and I. We're called to proclaim the gospel. And more people are needed. And we need to pray for them. We need to pray people into the kingdom and into our ministries. Here at Grace Street, God has told us that we have all these new ministries. We have, we have two whiteboards filled with things that we want to do. But we also recognize that we don't have the people to do all of them. So we're praying for those people to join us. And that may be uh, for worship. That may be praying for a piano player. Or a drummer. Or another guitar player. And maybe more singers. Because 
Wouldn't it be awesome to have two worship teams where everybody wouldn't need to get worn out? We're praying for ministry leaders, for, for youth and children. We're praying for uh, prayer leaders. We have big dreams, big God dreams. And in order to get there, we need people to join the harvest. But we also need to pray them into place. See, we, like the disciples, have become messengers. We are Christ's representatives. So like the disciples and the apostles, we are given the authority to do what Jesus did. And, and, and I go further to say what Jesus does. Because Jesus is still making himself known to people all over the world. So he's still doing. And there are so many people out there that are just waiting, waiting for you and I to talk to them, waiting for us to go out to them, and tell them about Jesus and show how they can have a relationship with him. And that's why he sent the apostles and the disciples and you and I. So let's go into chapter 10 of Matthew, where Jesus sends out the 12 apostles. Matthew writes, Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. And here are the names of the 12 apostles. First, there was Simon, also called Peter. Then Andrew, Peter's brother. James, son of Zebedee, John, James's brother, Philip, Bartholomew, who was also known potentially as Nathaniel, Thomas, Matthew, the tax collector, who, if you look in other parts of scripture, is called Levi. And then there's James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, who was also known as Judas, son of James, because they wanted to keep him separate. And then Simon the Zealot, and of course, Judas Iscariot, who would later betray him. So 12. Accidental number there? I don't think so. How many tribes of Israel were there? 12. So here's what I heard as I, as I was preparing. Jesus was preparing 12 new leaders for the tribes of Israel. He was preparing 12 new leaders to take his message and go out further. And we are also called and chosen by God to follow him. So how are you responding to that call? What are you doing to respond to the call that has been put on your life? Have you been fighting it? I was telling Mark, I, at 14, I was the troop chaplain's aide for my scout troop. Then I heard God say, you are going to be a pastor. You are going to teach my word. And at 18, I thought I knew better. It would take 14 years. God let me walk through my own desert. And then he called me back. And he called me to my knees. And he said, are you going to listen now so that I can use you? See, we don't want to try pulling what Jonah did. Jonah, what did he do when God told him to go to Nineveh? He ran the other way, hopped on a boat, and tried to get as far away as he could. Didn't work out so well for him, did it? What did he end up doing? He ended up going to Nineveh. And he ended up getting mad because he knew God was going to forgive them if they repented. And what did the people do when he gave the message? They repented, and he was mad at God. I'm pretty sure he got over it. But God can do amazing things when we just listen. In verse 5, it can, uh, Matthew continues saying, Jesus sent out the 12 apostles with these instructions. He said, don't go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans, but only to the people of Israel, God's lost sheep. Go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy, and cast out demons. Give as freely as you have received. Now, for a long time, I would read that first part there, and I would be a little confused about the instructions. Because I knew God, Jesus came to save everyone. But here he's telling them to only go to the Israelites, not the Gentiles, not the Samaritans. 
just to the people of God. I mean, John 3, 16, 17 says this, For this is how God loved the world, not Israel, the world. He gave them his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. I hear world over and over through that passage, but we go back and he said, just go to the Jews. Just go to my chosen people. Jesus had to start somewhere. You see, he did this, he was preparing through these first missions where he would send the disciples out while he was still with us. He was preparing them to prepare the people to do what? To go out into the world. So Jesus had a plan. He didn't start big right away where, you know, when we start really big and we try to do something, what happens? We tend to fail. And oftentimes Mark will say, if you want to need an elephant, you do that one bite at a time. So it's one step at a time, and that's what Jesus was doing here. So we, we've got to remember and see this passage with uh, God eyes. We need to see the big picture here and understand the roadmap to getting where he was going. And see, once the apostles and the disciples started taking the gospel, the good news beyond Israel, then the Gentiles, what happened? The Gentiles came in droves into the church. Because they wanted the same hope that we know. And the gospel now has been preached all around the world. But there's still more work to do. Because even though there's still some places in the world that these little nooks and crannies that may don't, have not heard the word of God, there's also people right in our own communities who do not know God, who do not have a relationship with him. So we cannot assume then that someone else is going to tell them. That's like driving down the road and you see an accident thinking, oh, somebody else will call 911. Now, if everybody thought that, what happens? It doesn't happen. Nobody stops to help. So we need to be mindful of that and we need to not assume that someone else will tell them. We all need to see what Jesus sees. Uh, Becca Shea, who's a Christian artist, she's got a, a, a song called Love Glasses, and she says, put your love glasses on. And, and I see that as in her song is, put your Jesus glasses on, or put your God glasses on. See the world through God's eyes, and know through that where you can help, where you can make a difference, how you can join the harvest. See, people... Jesus saw the people and he heard the people. And that's what we need to do. And then when we do that, then we can have compassion. We can have the compassion that Jesus felt for those people. And with compassion, what happens? When you, get, when you get our, uh, feel compassion for someone, that moves you into action. You start doing Things. You start reaching out. I know that's why you got involved with HACAP. That's why we get involved in other things and, and in other ministries and, and other community things. Because we feel compassion. And then we have to think. And I, and I go, this is like, what, 20 years ago? The little bracelets that we all, that everybody had that said WWJD. What would Jesus do? So when we, when we see what Jesus sees and we have the compassion that he has and we're moved to action, then we have to think, what would Jesus do in that situation? And then we need to do it as well. We need to look beyond what we think we can do and see what God does. Because when we do that, what happens? God gives us big God ideas and he gives us big God plans, and he said, go and do. Here's the thing that I want you to remember. Someone cared enough to share this message with you. 
Do you have people in your life that you care about? And if so, are you talking to them? I can remember several years ago before my, my mother passed away, I point blank asked her in, in private, it was a private conversation with her, and I did the same with my dad a little bit later. I said, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? I need to know. Because when you pass, I want to know that when it's my time, that, I, that you're going to be in the same place. We need to do that with our other family and with our friends and with our children, our coworkers. We need to, as we've talked about before, we need to have a relationship with those people. So we need to do what we need to talk to them. We need to do what Jesus did. We need to pray that God would show us how he wants us to do things. We need to pray to God who he wants us to do it for. Remember the last thing that Jesus said in this, in this passage. He said, give as freely as you have received. See, it's time to put that action into what we call prayer, care, and share, which is what our ministry is based on. We need to pray for people. In fact, pray for God to tell you who he wants you to pray for and then pray for them. And pray for them in, in ways that you may not be thinking. Pray for them that they would be open to hearing. Pray for them and care for them. Show that compassion. Put that compassion into action. And then you will have earned the right to share with them. And remember what we talked about before. If you share with one person, now there's two. And if then you both go out and share with one more person, there's four. And that keeps multiplying and that keeps growing in the kingdom. You remember Jesus transformed us. He let us, through the power of the Holy Spirit, be transformed. So we need to, through the power of the Holy Spirit, transform our families and our neighborhoods and our city and our state and our nation and ultimately the world one at a time. And I've told this story before, but I think back to the late 1800s and there was a, a gentleman in a small country church who God heard the call to start a men's Bible study. So he did. It was from that men's Bible study, six guys. One and then six. And then one of those guys did another Bible study. And someone from that Bible study became an evangelist in the early 1900s. And that evangelist went around and he would do these great revivals. And through the, it was the 30 second something stanza of Amazing Grace. Guess what happened? A 16 year old kid comes to know the Lord. Here's the thing. From that one person, we get to this kid. We don't think much about that until you realize that that young man, that 16-year-old, would become the Reverend Dr. Billy Graham. And Reverend Graham has reached millions for the gospel. So this goes into the hope that we have. This goes into uh, the blessing that God gives to us. Remember, blessing isn't necessarily he's going to fill your, your wallet with cash. The blessing is, think about Abraham. What did he promise Abraham? I will make you father of nations. Your descendants will be greater than the sands. Did Abraham see that happen? No. But he knew the blessing. He knew the promise. And because of that, we can be blessed. Now remember what we have talked about before, about starting and standing by and praying for and caring for and sharing with one person. Do that. If we join the harvest and we go out and share like that, then they will join the harvest. And then we will have more workers for the harvest. And as we do that, think about this. Think of, we can say, here we are, Lord, send us. Let's join the harvest and see what God does. Father God, we just thank you that 
you sent Jesus as our example that we would be able to and learn how to see as he sees to have that compassion that drives us into action as Jesus did so that we can do what he did and ultimately we can look beyond what we thought we could do into what you would have us do by being engaged in sharing the gospel. Father, we thank you for your many blessings in our life. We thank you that that blessing goes beyond what we currently see, Father, because we know that as your children, that blessing extends out and becomes maybe not something here, but it goes beyond here, Father, and we know that takes us to heaven where we can spend eternity with you. And for that, Father, we are dearly blessed. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' precious and holy name. And all God's children said, as we come into our time for communion together here today, um, I'm reminded of what Jesus called us to do and what he was calling his disciples to do was to come together, to commune with one another. And as we gather each time in the name of Christ, when we gather here as a congregation, when we commune with one another, we join in unity with one another. And so as we go into our time of communion today, I invite you, if you have your Bibles handy, to go to Mark 14, 22. And in this, we're talking about the Last Supper as they prepared to go. And it says, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, take it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it and gave it to them and they all drank from it. And then he said, this is the blood which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as specific sacrifice for many. And I tell you the truth that I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. So as we come before you today, and as we celebrate this communion, this gathering together, as we celebrate remembering the sacrifices that Christ made for us, he took the bread and broke it. And he offered it up and he said, take and eat, this is my body. And after he blessed the cup, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. It's our opportunity to join with him, with his blood and body, that cleansing for us. Now, normally we take our communion by intention, but during these times here, we've gone to have the communion cup and the wafer. And so in people's interest of their health, we have the bread, the body of Christ, The blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. So we forgot to do this last. We were so out of out of uh, practice with having people with us that, that we forgot to do this last week. But uh, normally at this time we do prayers for the people. And, and here's what I would suggest uh, before we do that here in, in person. If you're online, if you're watching online, put a prayer in the comments if you need prayer. Or send us a, a private message so that we can pray for them and we can pray for you. Because it's important to us to pray for one another. Because prayer, prayer has so much power. So again, if you're online, please drop us a note in the comments or message us, email us, what have you, and let us know. Is there anyone here in, with us in the sanctuary that has a prayer request? Yes. Matthew 
My mother, Catherine, has been in the hospital for three weeks. Um, she had an infected leg two days ago, and she's still feeling very weak. So I pray that God strength comes into her and puts healing for her. And also, I had a knee surgery. Pray for my knee that I will be healed and um, can walk by the time I get married in November. And pray for my fiance who's um, overseas. Absolutely. So your mom's name is Kay. Yeah. Catherine. Catherine. Does she go by K or Catherine? Um, either. K. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we, we lift up K. And we lift up Sue. And we lift up Sue's fiance, Father. You've heard this prayer request, Father. We pray for help. We pray for healing. We pray for safety. Father, there's other prayer requests that are out there, Father that have been either maybe left online for us or messaged to us or not even spoken at all, but lifted up to you, Father. We lift those up as well right here and right now, Father, knowing that you are the ultimate healer, that you will take care of those requests. But Father, we also pray for healing from this, this, this sickness that has taken over the world, this COVID-19, Father. We pray for that there would not be a second or a third or any more waves of it, that the people that you have given the knowledge will develop a vaccine, Father, and a cure. Father, we pray for the, the unrest that is in our world right now. We pray that people would not feel marginalized, that they would be felt as equals, that they would know that they are your loved children, as we all are. Father, we just thank you, and we praise you, and we lift these up to you. In Jesus' precious and holy name.